Good evening. I want to welcome you all to the conversation we're having tonight with uh, Phyllis Tickle and Brian McLaren about the future of the church. It's so fun. A title that makes both of them, I understand, very nervous. <laughs> Predicting it's a dangerous uh, exercise. two months out, let alone 10 or 20 years. I wanted to offer, in addition to a welcome both to the folks here and the folks who are live streaming us, just a word of, of explanation or preparation. When we, uh, when we struck it rich, and we're able to entice these two interesting, creative, curious people to spend some time with us. We wanted to make this opportunity as widely available as possible. So we um, decided to live stream it, and we're grateful for the folks who are tuning in from all over the place. We also wanted to find a way to engage the communities both here and away, um, but in a way that maximized the time we had for conversation. So we sent out an invitation to all the participants coming for questions they would like uh, our guests to address, as well as uh, be a working preacher, and got close to 100 responses. And I've tried to sort and sift through those and group some of those questions together, and we'll turn to those as we're able, also wanting to privilege just wherever the conversation would go. Uh, so, Brian and Phyllis, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thank and you for having us. Telling us what the future will be like. <laughs> oh, yeah. he's going to tell you. <laughs> where, where this should, is the prophet. Where we should here. place our bets. <laughs> <laughs> what stock? That's okay too if you want to throw that in. Um, Phyllis uh, graced us with a with a paper. I was surprised that uh, you brought you. I hate reading to people. I just well, you know it came my, through very well. Well, thank uh, you, but, but I, just, uh, I did a paper. You've never seen me read anything heavy in public before, no. <laughs> and uh, and much of that was sketching for us the contours of what the yes. emergent generation is or the emergent reality of the church. So I thought, Brian, I'd start and ask you your own sense uh, briefly when you think about that phrase, emergent Christianity. What comes to mind and how, if someone knew almost nothing about it and said, I hear you're an expert on, which always yeah. makes you nervous, <laughs> yeah. how would you answer? And then if he doesn't get it right, I'll count on you to correct Oh, okay. I, I will be happy to do that. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> well, uh, I, I should say, uh, David, that I, I do feel, have mixed feelings about it because, uh, you know, there's a tendency in the religious industrial complex to come up with the next fad that then becomes heavily marketed and branded and so on. And it, it is, I think, destructive in a lot of ways. Uh, it, here's one of them. It's really even implicit in the question, what's the future of the church? It suggests that something is going to happen and we all ought to adjust to it or figure out how to profit by it. And that is a very disempowering assumption. Uh, what if the far better assumption is what should the future be and how should we be involved in that? You see, it's very different to say how do we fit in with something that's inevitable uh, and, and it's the difference between sort of having history happen to you and actually playing an active part in making history. And I have never felt that whatever is emerging was enough of a, of a thing that people should adjust to it as much as it was a possibility that we all could contribute to. So here's the way I would say it. Uh, in all sectors of the church, Catholic, mainline Protestant, evangelical, Pentecostal, ethnic uh, churches, peace churches, uh, we have similar stresses going on. The world is changing really fast. Uh, people are trying to figure out how to adjust and and, and none of our churches are doing that well. You know, for a while we thought, oh, the mainline Protestants are struggling, the Catholics are struggling, but the evangelicals are fine. But that's not true either. They're struggling. And there are all kinds of signs of desperation in the Pentecostal world as well. So we're all in this time of stress. There's a group of people who say, what we need to do is exactly what we are doing. Just do it harder and better. And there's another group of people who say, we need to do what we were doing 100 or 500 or 800 years ago. There's another group of people who, who are saying, I don't know what to do. Do you? <laughs> uh, and when those people get together, the interesting thing is a Catholic and a Baptist and a Pentecostal who come around the table, who are all asking that question, have a really nice dinner party and a really nice discussion. 
they get along with each other, other better than they do with people in their own tradition who are either digging in their heels or going backward. So to me, it's this conversation that is saying what the Christian faith will be in 30 or 50 or 70 years, in all likelihood, will be quite different from what it is now. Let's work together and try to help that be a positive uh, change. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. A lot of sense. I think one of the <clears throat> ways most people think about emergent in terms of the communities is generationally. Yeah. And there's been a, a heavy emphasis on that this is a movement of our young people. One of the overwhelming sets of questions uh, that came in was, you know, how do we keep our young people? How do we change preaching, worship, our community that our children and grandchildren will want to come to? young people will come to. The second largest subset of questions was then from pastors saying, but how do we do that in a way that doesn't drive our older people away? Um, so I'm curious when, it, when it, it doesn't break down perfectly generationally, but when you step back, it looks like it has some generational overtones, uh, and I'm wondering to make I, it... I, 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 I'm interrupting. I'm no, sorry. No, you're, no. you're the person to answer this one. Good <laughs> conversations have some of that. Yeah. Uh, I hear what you're saying, and I hear it a good deal on the road. I'm sure you do too. The, the truth of it is you're speaking as if there were only two cohorts in, in the spread of population, and there are three. Uh, there's the 40 or 45s and under. And those people were born in emergent society. They were born in this new world. And there are people 60 or 65 and over, and they really are immigrants, to use Stanley Howell's, you know, they're immigrants to a, a different world. But there's that funny thing in the middle uh, and there's nothing funny about being between 45 and 60 or 65. You know, but, <laughs> you're, you're but they're, yeah, I'm telling you, I'm looking right. I'm so glad I'm out of there. You can't, <laughs> I can't tell you I'm glad I am I'm out of there. Uh, but we need to, to um, be really careful here. There, there are sociological reasons for what's happening. People 60 and 65 have a certain impunity in our society. Um, they, they do. I mean, I'm 80. Well, I, I should worry about my career? Oh, please. You know, uh, I, I'm going I'm to do and say what I, and, and to some extent, that starts when you're 60 or 65. They also have the money, uh, and they have, uh, they have the ability to, cons to, to play with the technology, to understand what's happening, uh, to do all of that, making them much more conversant with the world of the 40s and under than they are with the, the in-between cohort. Uh, their, their grandchildren matter. It's the in-between cohort. It's that middle age group that parishes that are growing. And this, this is a statistical fact. Diana's got the research on this. The parishes that are actually growing, or congregations, are those that, that play to that middle cadre of, of age. Um, uh, who want to be, you know, more Methodist than Wesley ever thought about being, if you will, or more, uh, more Protestant than, or, or, or Presbyterian than Calvin ever wanted to be. Um, because we marry later, no really, we, we marry later, we have our children later, and therefore there, there's this wonderful thing that the middle age crisis and their puberty hits at the same time. And either one of them would wreck a household, you know, but it's, it's, it's catastrophic. And so the church has got to give us the rules. And, and, and the church right now, like it or not, is, is really very good at giving us the rules still. We haven't got over it, and we should have. Uh, and so that cohort is growing. Um, so when a pastor says to me, what should I do about not losing my own people? I want to say, sweetheart, as long, you know, love them. Uh, they're going to go with you. They have the flexibility. When we were saying a, a minute ago that uh, when I go into a cohort meeting, uh, it's a third of the people there are as white-haired as I am. Uh, and, and part of it is uh, the, the desire to get back to the young people. You know, you know the old Carol Burnett joke, which I love to tell all the time, that kids and their grandparents get along so well because they have a common enemy. Uh, and, <laughs> and, 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 and it's true, it's the best joke she ever made. Uh, and, and, and that group in there is going to love traditional or inherited church until they die. Of course, each year they get a little older and a little nearer the grave, so, you know, there's a, but, but the business of worrying about losing your old people um, is, I think, a dangerous fairy tale. It's a fallacy. I think it's a fairy tale as well. Uh, if you can indeed um, 
begin to preach and, and to serve and to be um, as, as, as these times require. Your old people are going to go with you. Your middle-aged people are probably not. Um, so it's that middle third that's the problem. It's the middle third that's, that's paying the bills right now. Quick, quick show of hands, how many of us are in that middle? <laughs> oh, God bless all of you. And the collection plate is at the door. Please put in as you go back. <laughs> because we're supporting your way of life. <laughs> but it's, it's a, so anyway, let's, enough said. Let's enough say said. for a moment, you've got a group uh, of elders who are eager mm -hmm for the grandchildren to come and confident enough to experiment and play. And you have a middle group that um, you've persuaded. Yes. How then might we think about, what kind of experiments would you find, would you recommend for a congregation that said, we wanna, we wanna make a place for our younger children, young adults, a place where they feel at home, where they want to come. I'd make two suggestions. Um, the first one would be to realize that no one is going to come to church it, just because you change the music or you have different Amen. Amen. Um, Absolutely. It's not like there's this long line of people. Say that one more time. Okay. Yes. One more time with feeling. <laughs> so it's not like there's this long line of people who are saying, I'm dying to go to church if they would just have drums. <laughs> or guitar. I think there were people like that in 1972, and maybe there are a few left in 1992, and there still are a few out there, but uh, I think we have to realize that day is gone. If people are going to come to church, they're going to come because they're invited by somebody who likes them and who they like, uh, and they see something in that they would like. So the first thing I would say is, uh, that don't expect anybody to come to church if you don't have four or five people you can invite. And then if those four or five people that you invite were to come, you'd have to say, what would give them cringe, what would make you cringe when they're there? I mean, the cringe factor is really, really important. Uh, and you know, there are things you don't notice until you bring a guest. Um, and I just think we'd have to start paying attention to those cringe factor things. Uh, and, and sometimes it's, well, at any rate, that's not easy to deal with. But that's the first thing I'd say. Nobody's going to come unless you invite them. So think about the people you want to invite. That's first. Second thing I'd say is, even if you invite them and they come, a lot of them aren't going to stay. Uh, because this just, the whole format of this thing is, mm -hmm. is a different culture for them. Mm -hmm. this, this thing that we call church is a particular phenomenon. It's it's, it's a particular recipe that certain people like. So then we'd have to say, if our goal isn't to get them to join our thing, but if our goal is, how could we help people come into a vital relationship with the Spirit of God, become part of a community that's joined in the mission of God, a uh, community of learning, uh, the, the ways of God, how could we do that? Well, now the sky's the limit. Uh, because what that might mean is instead of trying to get people to come on a Sunday, we'd say, let's, could we have uh, 15 volunteers for people who will stop coming to church on Sunday mornings? We'd probably find a lot of volunteers. And we'd say, what we'd like you to do is the three or four hours that you invest coming every Sunday, we'd like you to have a dinner party every Thursday night and invite some people over for dinner, and we're gonna give you some resources to have a meaningful discussion and see what that could happen. I mean, if, if that's the kind of creative thinking that I would encourage under those circumstances. Here's an interesting thought. I have a good friend, well, many of you would know the name uh, Gordon Cosby, who passed away recently. Yes. In the last few years of Gordon's life, I was with him several years ago, he, and it was just so interesting, this man in his 90s, who's revered for his work at Church of the Savior, saying, I just don't think we figured it out yet. I just don't, uh, I, we, we, we haven't even begun. Mm -hmm. So the last few years of his life, Gordon was helping these, uh, assisted by a wonderful Lutheran uh, uh, named Becca Stell. Uh, they, they've been, we're trying to get people together where you could not form, they called it a spiritual support group, you could not form that spiritual support group unless you had people of different races and people of different social classes. 
They say, why even bother creating another group if it's just middle class or upper class people? So you have to have people who are poor and you have, uh, along with people who are rich and you have to have people of different races come together because they said it's not really spiritual growth unless we're bridging some of those divides. Boy, that would shake people up. But boy, if somebody, if you got invited to a group like that, you might not go. But if you turn down the invitation, you'd think you were missing something. And I just wish we had some invitations that when people turned them down, they thought, wow, I didn't do that, but I would have been a way better person if I had, you know? <laughs> uh, and because right now when they turn down our invitation, I don't think they feel, feel that way. Yeah. When I'm uh, out on the road talking about some of the cultural changes we're, we're working at, inevitably three or four people stay afterwards. They're usually in their middle, late 50s or up and they'll tell the exact same story. My children are good people. They're doing work that's meaningful. <laughs> they're doing God's work in the world. They have a sense of purpose. I know their decisions are shaped profoundly by the faith tradition in which we raise them, and they have no interest in church. <laughs> and the, the follow-up is, what do we do? And I think, I think you're beginning to help yeah. us think about, about what we do differently than simply imagining that the be all end all of church is to be a destination. And if we're not a destination, mm -hmm. but a way station or um, <clears throat> a community that equips others, or, um, you know, I've been thinking about it lately as an internet, an interstate rest stop. Um, <laughs> yeah. Job is to fill up, get back on the road. Sometimes you don't stop because you don't need to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you are looking at the gas gauge thinking I should have stopped, but I will the next time. I, I, that's a leap of imagination, though, yeah. because most of us tend to think it's all about centripetal force. It's all about bringing people here. Yes, it's, it's, it's the nature yeah. of the institution to be attractional. We're, we're it just it. is, and it's the nature of what this new Christianity is to be missional, and they're just not the same thing. Because if you push, with all due respect, if you push the pastor who really wants to know how to get more people in, what really is, ha or, the, or the Senate or, or whatever, what really is happening is attracting this way, and that's not going to happen. It's, it's this way, you know, what can we give you, what we can... The British, who've been at this a lot longer than we have, uh, uh, this whole emergence thing uh, over, you know, um, actually 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they were dealing with it. Uh, and they speak of Kirk and Chicks as being part of the answer to this. Uh, and of course, it's the image of the mother hen, the kirk, the Scottish word for church. Um, the mother hen with the chicks. And that what's going to have to happen, the use of the church, they say, uh, is to support the little chicks out here. Four or five people in an apartment house who pray together every Tuesday night and who would occasionally like a pastor to come by or a bivocational to join them. Six or eight people over here who have dinner together th every Thursday night and it's a Bible study and they would like to say they are affiliated with St. Swiggins on the Bog or whatever the Lutheran church is or the, you know. Um, uh, and, and occasionally, uh, you know, have some sort of oversight. They're not gonna ever contribute to St. Spickens, uh, probably, in any way. But that affiliation, that ability to touch the tradition uh, and to touch some informed uh, clergy, uh, but not be over here every Sunday morning. Um, and the Kirk and Chick thing works. Now the Kirk has to remember that that it is a one-way street financially in many ways, and in membership in many ways it is. But it gets back to what you were saying. It's the kingdom of God, ladies and gentlemen. It, that's out there where, uh, and these are primarily young folk uh, who are doing these things, you know, who, who bowl together maybe every Friday night, but they have prayer before and beer after. No, they have prayer before and, and, and prayer after, but whatever, uh, you know, or they meet in a pub uh, or, or something. But their affiliation is loosely with this congregation and this pastoral staff. Um, and then the, the, the staff has to remember that sometimes during holy days, they're going to want to come. They're going to want to come to that transcendence that is the traditional building and the traditional service. But not every Sunday, because it's not anything to do with what they're doing. And it's not the kind of give and take, talk about the Bible, uh, or talk about life, or talk about circumstances, that's going to get them anywhere. That's better done at the local pub on Thursday night or at the bowling alley on Friday night. 
where there is that kind of easy interchange amongst Christians. Um, so Kirk and Chick, we need to look quite seriously at in this country. They also talk about tent, tent, uh, tent and synagogue and temple, where the Abrahamics have always been transmitted in the tent. Uh, and one of our problems right now is that the home is not doing what it should have been doing for various and sundry social reasons that are important. But uh, the synagogue, we need to understand that it's the synagogue's function to reinforce the tent, not to make the whole thing. The temple, what we would call the church, is where you do the transcendence, where you touch the, the wonder of the tradition. Uh, it's where Jerusalem and Antioch have conversation together. So that um, I think we need to look seriously at what our British brothers and sisters are doing in terms of the mission-shaped church uh, and how they're seeing it and the work of people like Maynard, for instance, who are talking about that. But it, it cannot be to attract them to the church. And it's really hard to get the church treasurer to understand this reasoning, you know? <laughs> he just doesn't get it. It's like the church organist doesn't get the music so pretty good sometimes, you know? Um, it, it, it does, it's hard to, to persuade, but it's gonna I, have to happen. I wanna sympathize for a moment with the church treasurer. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, no, I, I, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not unsaying because those are very real concerns, obviously. But I, I think but, it's also, so one task is this leap of imagination to yeah. imagine the very function and being of church differently not attractional, but missional. Yes. But there's this other, even if you, okay, they're not gonna contribute, we, we, we get that. We're not set up in any remote way, economically, by ability. That's right. Buildings and pensions and. That's right. And I think sometimes the, it's it, one of the unintended consequences of this kind of conversation is a whole lot of pastors leave thinking, I'm screwed. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've got this congregation, and we can't not afford to have people come. Yeah. Yes, um, that's right. Where, you know, unless one whole thing passes away and another emerges, are there bridges? Are yeah. there um, ways to kind of yeah. ease the way? I mean, that's not the right language, but. Well, let me say something about that, because I don't think what either Phyllis or I are saying is, that it's an all or nothing, no, either not. or. I think, in fact, it might help us if we divide our work into several different categories. One is we have all the people who attend church and we can help them become better disciples and we can help s support them and all the rest. We can, we have, a, if all we did is help them become better disciples of Jesus Christ, that would keep us pretty busy. Uh, and, and the fact is, a lot of us, that's not the business we're in. We wish that's the business we're in, but the real business we're in is trying to keep them from firing us and making us miserable by writing nasty emails about us and now it would be, you know, whatever else. So, you know, that's, that's a big enough job, really reasserting our role as spiritual leaders, shepherds, pastors, over the people that are already there. I'd say there's another work, and that's of all the people who have dropped out and wish that they could be there again, including the children of many of these yes. people who have dropped out. Yes. By the way, one of the uh, quick story, I, I was asked to teach at something called the College of Preachers in Washington, D.C. It was, ended up being the last one they ever did, which I think I'm blamed for that, but <laughs> we, had, we had a great time, but uh, I, we had people come together for a week to talk about preaching. I don't remember anything I taught, uh, but I remember one night I got, I forget, I think it was five or six young adults who had dropped out of church. And so we just did a panel where those six young adults sat up and, and all the pastors could ask them questions. I made the pastors have a vow that they wouldn't try to recruit or convert or correct them, but would really try to learn from them. And all of the people who attended that still remember that. And, I think there's enormous power that could be had by us tracking down our own kids and grandkids who've left and, and really listening. As yes. my friend uh, Pat Kiefert here at Luther uh, Seminary says, listening people into free speech. That could be a really big thing, so that's good. That's all one set of work. There's this other set of work over here for the growing numbers of people who really, this is just a different world for them. You mentioned England. I think of a pastor friend of mine in London who said, if I go up to a young adult in London and ask him about becoming a Christian, it feels like I'm asking him to become an Aztec. Mm -hmm. 
like that's not a living religion in my world anymore. So, you know, we've got that work um, to do as well. But, th and that's really important work. But this is important work too. One other thing I'd say is in, in all the sort of deconstructive things we're saying about traditional ways of doing church, I'm not happy about this, this abandonment of mm -hmm. the community uh, of faith for many reasons. One of which is, I'm really worried what happens to the kids of the kids right. who are yes. pulling off a spiritual life, but in a sense, they had 10 or 12 or 18 years of deposits put into them that they're living out. But I don't know how their kids are gonna get those deposits put into them right. to live out, which is why we have to pay attention you know, to, to this side over here. Uh, and can I just say, and this is where we do really have a problem, because if you say to the people who've left and the people over here, what about coming back here? It's some of these people that are scaring these people away. And they're scaring them away, occasionally by a liberal fundamentalism, but usually it's by a conservative fundamentalism, uh, anti-science bias. You cannot do that. Uh, anti-gay, anti, it really, a kind, I'm just gonna be very frank, a kind of Fox News Christianity that is far more deeply embedded in mainline Protestantism than most mainline Protestants know. Uh, you know how many Methodists get up on Monday morning and listen to Rush Limbaugh going into work and every, every day? So, you know, that, this is this other phenomenon that's going on. And I don't think we're going to make progress until we address, address that, that we've got a whole lot of agendas other than the gospel of the kingdom of God at work um, in, in, in our people. Yeah. One of the ways I think about this, these challenges is a generational shift in motivation mm -hmm. from the greatest generation very much motivated by a sense of duty, you did things because you knew you should, to a generation that is so overwhelmed by opportunities and obligations that they make choices, the generation of discretion. It needs to mean something to them. And that leads me, or leads us often, to talk about this group that doesn't want to particularly get committed to a church or a community. And yet, they are getting committed to communities um, called hockey teams. <laughs> or soccer teams, or swimming teams, and that in some ways the greatest competition of a lot of congregations on Sunday morning is not a mosque or a synagogue or right. a new age center, it's hockey practice. That's right. And when you talk with parents about it, they're like, if we don't show up, we're out. <laughs> they're very committed to that community. And uh, so I, it, I'm inclined to say it's a different generational ethos. They don't make those kinds of commitments, but they are making those kinds of commitments. Oh, yes, and they're making commitments to, to things like that. Yeah. The question is, why the hockey team instead of church? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, think they're, I think they're good answers for why the hockey team instead of church. And one of the things we're not saying here is that one of the huge shifts we've made is into post-Christendom. Uh, and whether we like it or not, we are post-Christendom now. We've been for 50 years probably, but self-consciously more or less for 30 years. So there's no political or social reinforcement for going to church. You know, I, I laugh mm -hmm. and say that the only people I know who go to church for professional reasons anymore are lawyers. Uh, you know, and, and, and they have to show. Yeah, I mean, it, they, they, but there's no social edge for most of us to go, and there's therefore no social reinforcement. Um, and so, but there is social reinforcement for taking your kids to the hockey team. I mean, absolutely, what you just quoted them as saying, we're out mm -hmm. if we don't do it. Well, out has changed definition. Uh, and uh, now, for the, to be in socially, it's the hockey team, and it's not gonna ever be the church. Uh, I think part of the, 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 the problem, I may be wrong, is our image of what success would be for the church, mm. or what we, think it should be. I understand economics. I, you know, we, we have to have the money. There's no question. And we're going to shut some, some churches. We just are. That has. But success is not, success is not the, the big building. It's not the big numbers. Success has got to be, are we rearing parents who can tell the story? Or are, we, are, are, we, are we touching the kingdom of God? Are we out at the hockey game 
you know, can we go borrow a parishioner's 15-year-old and take him or her to hockey so we can have access? I, I said once to the House of Bishops and got castigated by one of the bishops. I was telling somebody this story today. Honestly, if you want to grow the church, truly get your parish or, uh, treasurer to give you $250 a month in, in barbell and then betake yourself to the local pub. It sounds like a tough assignment, right? But take yourself to the nearest pub and sit down, collar here, keys here, beer here, and be there every whatever, Friday at 5.30 or something, same time of day, same day of the week, for five or six weeks. The, the caller says I'm in the business, the keys say I'm just passing through, and the beer says I'm a good guy or a good gal. Uh, and, and you're going to pick up within four or five weeks five or six people who want to come and talk God. Now, they're not going to be in your pews. It'll work every time, you know. Or if it doesn't change bars, you're clearly in the wrong pub. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but, it, but it, it will, and, and what I got in trouble was with one of the bishops, I don't know whether I ever told you this or not, he came up afterwards and said, you're talking about pimping for God. And I said, that's right, I call it mission, you call it pimping, it doesn't matter. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it really happened, you can't make this stuff up. It, it, really, did, it really did happen. Uh, but that's, that's where it is. And, and until we understand we're post-Christendom, uh, and I, I think it's like maybe the Achilles heel in these conversations every time we have them, is that we've not faced the fact it ain't no wonderful thing to be Christian now. Uh, you know, it's almost a disadvantage uh, to some extent. And until we realize we're pastoring in that, we're witnessing in that, we're discipling in that, even those of us who aren't in the clergy, uh, not you, me. Uh, you know, we're, we're functioning in, in that attitude. It's a whole different thing. It's a whole different thing. Do you think there's some serious lag time in the post-Christendom? Oh, I think there's, of, of course, of course there's um, lag time. There's especially lag time. here, you know, here in the Midwest, there's, yeah. there's yeah. places where it, it, it's, I think in a lot of towns or communities, there's still a lot of that Christendom at work, places in the Deep South, I think that's true. And, and, you know, there's one other thing that bothers me about this kind of conversation is that there's a sense of despair. Now, I don't work for the church or a church, so I can afford to, you know, right? I mean, I've got no pension riding on this thing, uh, which does give a certain Im impunity. But there's a sense of despair that is almost defeating uh, mm -hmm. somehow that we've got to jump. Uh, that 500 years ago, if Roman Catholics had been as neurotic about figures as we are, they would have shot the Pope, burned the Vatican, and moved to China because there was nothing to make Protestants out of except Roman Catholics, right? There's nothing to make, but there wasn't. I mean, that's the only building material you've got. Uh, and, and for us, there's nothing to make new Christians out of except Protestants and Roman Catholics and, and a few Anglicans. Uh, so, of course, the figures in those established divisions are going to drop even as they go up in uh, emergence expressions, in neo-monastics, and, you know, and those figures are rising, we know they are. Uh, not that there's any way to track them, because it's not that organized, but you can see it happening. And so the despair over falling numbers is immediate and personal if it's your pension, if you're sitting up here wherever it is we're sitting, uh, and not dependent on pension, then I, I feel a need, almost missional need, to say, don't despair. We're dealing in God's work, you know. God's not going to be defeated. And in and, and the same way that Protestantism emerged, this thing is emerging, and it's not the end of the world. Uh, but despair can be a drug. It can be a very anesthetizing, depressing drug that paralyzes you. And there's no, there's no reason for despair that I can see. Or if there was despair, I would despair about those who are spiritual and not religious, or, or, or some of those folk out there. I would be concerned about them. Um, anyway, end of sermon. <laughs> I, I, just, I just, despair scares me. That's right. It's the most defeating position, and I hear it more and more as I do more and more clergy meetings. And I understand, you know. I'm 55 years old. I got two kids in college. Ah! Uh, kind of <laughs> thing, you know. I, I wanted to go back to your comment, uh, David, about hockey teams. Of course, where I live... I've heard of hockey, but... <laughs> Florida doesn't have any? But I'm thinking, you know, in my world, it would be soccer teams or yoga practice or something like that. And 
you know, one of the interesting things that maybe we ought to listen to all the parents who are taking their kids to soccer is that they come away thinking, my kid actually learned how to do something for these two hours. And this is one of the problems of Christendom. You didn't really have to learn to do anything. Right. You just had to show up to make a respectable appearance. And I've thought about this a lot, you know, looking at people close to me who have dropped out of church and even looking at myself after I left the pastorate and I didn't have to go to church and I had the option of staying home, asking myself, what makes me want to get up and go? And, and I'll tell you, if, if I really had confidence that by showing up, I will learn how to be a more loving person. Uh, you know, I can come back from soccer practice dribbling a little better, from hockey practice, I guess, shooting a little better. Um, could I come home from church being a little more patient, having a little more forbearance, you know, those sorts of things. And this to me is where it gets interesting. And this is where the people dropping out and the declining numbers could be an incredible gift, not only to us, but to the world, if it actually made us force ourselves to get good at helping people <laughs> learn to play, you know? <laughs> well, I, you're naming a tangible benefit. Yeah. And we all sometimes get very uncomfortable about imagining church should have tangible benefits. Um, <laughs> it feels like works righteousness, or it's functional, or it's uh, um, too crassly pragmatic. But, this is my confession, um, when our oldest was confirmation age, he was in swimming, it would have been hard, not impossible, to make swimming and confirmation work. Uh, it would have meant missing swimming that Wednesday night. And here's the thing. Jack is a happier boy when he goes to swimming. He's an adolescent. Mm -hmm. We don't live on a farm. I can't send him out to build fences. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Not only was he happier, we, we were, were happier. happier. <laughs> <laughs> we got that. <laughs> Two miles in the pool, we're all happier. So on the one hand, I totally get it, and we, we made that choice uh, for swimming. On the other hand, what I'm plagued by is sort of a short-term, long-term. Yeah. Sure, of course. Uh, he will acquire skills. He will get better at a sport. I played sports I valued a lot. I don't anymore because it wrecked my body. Yeah. <laughs> at some point, he'll be done sports. Will he have yeah. a spiritual yeah. the reservoir yeah. to draw on? Yeah. Um, and that's a hard conversation to, to have. But sometimes I think maybe we ought to start having it. I mean, yeah. even raising it with our families, with our kids, about what are the different choices we're making how can we mm -hmm. show a sense of what you're gaining in this, and how can we sort of think together about long-term versus short-term? Mm -hmm. But I don't, know we I don't know if we talk about this at all. I mean, I think we get caught trying to do it harder, harder, better, better, um, and don't ask, what do you need? Yeah. Uh, maybe for fear of the answer. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me play this out in two <laughs> domains in the real world. So I live right near the Gulf of Mexico, and a couple years ago when we had the BP oil spill, I kept, I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that those BP employees, most of them live in Texas and Louisiana. Almost all of them are either Catholic, Southern Baptist, or Assembly of God. And I thought to myself, that failure of the BP, uh, what was it called, Horizon, Deep Horizon, whatever it was called, well, was also a failure of churches to teach their people that you don't sign a report that isn't legitimate. And you, you, you don't pretend things are fine when they aren't because you're a Christian. When you're a Christian, you work differently. You know? they, they weren't taught that. Uh, uh, you, you think about what's going on in our, in our civic life and this complete breakdown of civility. And you think, wow. We, if, if the mixture of religion and politics has done anything in the last three or four decades, it's brought down both. Yes, it has. Yes. Uh, yeah. and, it, and what has happened is political people are talking more the way preachers talk, damning people to hell, and you know what I mean? That's sort of stereotyping and all the rest. And, and you realize, wow, we have some work to do in actually teaching civility and respectful disagreement and so on. 
So I, all of this just makes me think the tangible benefits of coming to church, suddenly they're important not just for the good of the church, <laughs> they're important for the good of the, the planet and the good of the, you know, of the survival of everything. Uh, so suddenly this stuff matters a whole lot. And when you project it and you project all the things that could, could go wrong that are already in the process of going wrong, you know, you just think, for example, if, if there were another big terrorist attack, how, how much would it take to get groups of vigilantes going burning down the houses of Muslim people? And you think, mm, yeah. are we preparing committed followers of Christ to go make a circle around the homes of Muslims in their neighborhood to put their lives at risk to protect others. I mean, this, when, when the gang forms with gasoline cans and torches and goes to the person's house, it's a little bit late to teach those sort of skills. So this to me is the urgency of, of this, to me, part of spiritual formation and discipleship. And when, you know, we talk about being a missional church, this is where mission often goes someplace. And, and so ironically, at the time when people are feeling despair, you think, oh, listen, don't despair now. We need you more than ever if we do more than just help people be connoisseurs of sermons and organ music. Yeah. Some of the, please go ahead. No, it, I was just listening to you. The, I don't, did you see the Barna report, I mean, maybe two years ago now? where 46% of the people interviewed said that going to church, that the people interviewed had to go to church at least twice a month or something. And 46% said church made no difference in how they lived their lives. I'm sorry, I said what? 46% said going to church made no difference in how they lived their lives, which is exactly what you're talking mm -hmm. about. And I thought at the time, what a condemnation. These are people who are going. Yeah. And it makes no difference in how they, what the BP employees do, which is what you're talking about, where, where religion hits the ground. Yeah. It's the floor running. Uh, yeah. And it's a serious, yeah. I wonder if part of this is catching up to the post-Christendom where there are not the cultural supports and rewards for going to church. Yeah. Yeah. Because at that time, well, I'm thinking about some of the research uh, Christian Smith and uh, yeah. Chrissy uh -huh. Dean have done where the number one reason youth have either, these are youth who have been going to church, either have sort of very, almost no sense of themselves as a Christian or a very thin sense. Number one reason is because they never heard their parents talk about or That's explain right. why they themselves were mm -hmm. committed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And parents immediately feel very guilty when we say that, but the fact was their parents never told them either because you didn't have to. That's right. Yes, that's right, you didn't and so have I to. so I think we sort of allowed, in a sense, the culture to make Christians, and our job was to inspire them. Mm -hmm. the culture's not making Christians mm -hmm. anymore. And, well and, said. and well we said. ought to say, and it wasn't then either. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, was, yeah, yeah. it was making churchgoers of a right. certain socially accept. but the right. fact was they were racist. The fact, you know what I mean? That, it's so ironic that we hold up the past as if we were doing so well. I, I, I get this all the time. I get accused, oh, you're, it's a slippery slope. You're slipping down the slope. I want to say, for crying out loud, I think I got here when we were already at the bottom of the slope. I'm trying to climb it. You know, I don't think we're, it's not like we, it was so great in the 1950s. It might have been good for white folks, but it wasn't so good for some other folks, you know? So this idea that it was so good in the past, no, maybe some of this, disintegration and unrest that we're having is this great gift from the Holy Spirit to say, hey, you weren't doing so well before. I'm just helping you get realistic. This is a great opportunity <laughs> to really do a better job as we move forward. <laughs> so the task then is the formation of a Christian identity, of a Christian imagination. Have you, in your work, kind of come across or observed patterns or practices of, of communities that are doing that particularly well that we could think about in our own congregational settings? Could, could I give an example from Africa? I know it's sort of distant and that makes it hard, but it's, it's one that I really see this and it, it exemplifies what we're talking about. So I've spent a good bit of time in, in East Africa the last few years, especially the little country of Burundi, the twin sister country of Rwanda. Uh, same uh, ethnic makeup, Hutu, Tutsi, uh, and actually more people in Burundi have been killed in genocide. It just wasn't one genocide of 800,000. It was about five genocides that totaled a million and a quarter. 
Uh, and the fact was, uh, Burundi and Rwanda were two of the countries with the highest church attendance of any country in the world uh, when their genocides happened. So a genocide has a way of making you wake up and say, we weren't as good as we thought. Uh, and in the aftermath of a genocide, you have to then start saying, okay, if this thing doesn't teach us to stop killing our neighbors, if this thing isn't strong enough so that we stop seeing one another through the lens of tribe, uh, you know, then it's really not so great. And uh, so it's been fascinating for me to watch the, this younger generation of East Africans. And again, everybody in the West is reading stories how the church is thriving in Africa. This younger generation looks and they say, if this is thriving, this is depressing. Uh, they're watching the prosperity gospel turn a whole lot of people into hucksters. They're, they're, they're just watching all kinds of things not work. But there, this, many of these young Christians that I've had the great privilege of meeting there, the, what they're doing in response is they're saying, okay, let's not criticize. They're not even saying, let's try to change that. They're just going out and trying to do something alternative. And uh, this to me is where it really gets interesting. I just think, you know, if we, the kinds of people who graduate from an institution like this, wouldn't it be amazing if we help more of them become something like kingdom of God community organizers rather than custodians of buildings and budgets. Not, there's nothing wrong with that, but you just think how this could all work together. In many ways, this is what the new monastic I was going to say, the new monastics, uh, I think, simply yeah. like this. They, and, and in a sense, I, I think our Catholic brothers and sisters knew something about this 50 or 60 years ago. Everybody didn't have to be a nun or a, a, or a brother, but almost every parish had uh, some households of nuns and brothers you know, around who did wonderful good works in the school or among the poor. It might be a Catholic worker house connected. And you, you realize that a few of these people doing real grassroots, exciting work, it kind of rubs off on everybody else. It's a kind of heroism that other people can admire. And it, you know, it makes you think, maybe some of the answer to this isn't that we, something that we change in what we're currently doing necessarily, but it's saying, we got to encourage these other little groups around that bring something new into the mix, you know. We just open our, our frame of reference a little bit, I think. Absolutely. A thousand percent, I agree. The, the neo-monastics are. And, and again, it's almost the Kirk and Chick model, too, in a way. It is. It, I mean, it, you know, it's the, it's the chicks out there. I, I've seen this in a few Methodist bishops who have gotten a hold of this. And so what they're trying to do is all over their uh, district or their conferences, they're trying to see these neo-monastic groups, believing that they will have this sort of natural, it's kind of like put a little furnace of 100 degrees over here and a little one of 100 degrees over here, a little one of 110 degrees over here, and pretty soon the 55 degree churches are up to 65 or 70. You know, you, you create some warmth by creating some heat in certain centralized places. And there's one other thing that needs saying, and I don't, I don't know quite how to say it without being misunderstood perhaps, but um, you can push so far bef before you get a, a push back, I suppose yeah. is what, I, what I'm really saying. We need to uh, be very aware that the, the Church of England is growing. Now, the Church of England hasn't grown since Henry VIII quit killing people for not belonging, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> and three years ago, the figure showed up at, I don't remember, it's like, 0.03% or something, and everybody thought it was an anomaly. And then last year it was 0.08%, I think. This year it looks like it's going to top 1%. Now that's not a huge growth, right? It's not. Why are they doing it? They're doing it because of something called the Alpha Program or similar programs in which they're taking very basic Christianity and teach, turning their, their basements or their parish halls into uh, coffee houses, essentially and teaching once a week basic Christianity, using the Alpha program, if that means anything to, to any of you. And, and for some of you, that would be just beyond belief because it's simplistic. Jesus was a man, period. That's J-E-S, I mean, it's that level of, you know. But 
but those congregations and those parishes are growing, which says to me, and to anybody else and those people whom I read, which says to me, there is now a, a kind of vacuum also. Mm -hmm. um, we can't assume that all the people who don't come wouldn't like to know. They just are so ignorant they don't know how to get at it. Uh, and if you can quietly provide mm -hmm. the essentials so I don't look stupid in, 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 when I'm among Christians, um, the things that my daddy didn't teach me because my daddy didn't know them either. Um, <laughs> if, if I can get them there. And gradually, uh, if you want to see it, look at Holy Trinity in Brompton, for instance, uh, and see what's happening to that parish right outside of London. Uh, and, and those figures are there. So there is growth in Latinized Christianity. We all know that in two-thirds world there's, there's growth. Uh, and, but what we're primarily talking about is Latinized Christianity. And you can look. Uh, at certain parishes that are beginning to teach what we would regard as simplistic. Uh, they're not teaching, you know, theology or doctrine. They're teaching basic sort of principles in the most, is simplistic is not a fair word, but that's, that's what it is, really. Mm -hmm. What you would regard as simplistic uh, and, and uh, very close to narrative. But it's working and the figures are there. This is coming up on the third year that we're getting growth in the Church of England. This, this doing feels this very a thing. little different than what we were saying earlier in the sense that the Alpha's not only pretty basic, which I think oh, is really Oh, very helpful, basic, yeah. But it's not just that, it's also, it's also pretty traditional slash conservative. Because you're gonna you know, get a backlash. I, atonement. I mean, that's, that's, that feels like, going mm -hmm. back to the way we did it, 50 years ago, mm -hmm. just better mm -hmm. in the sense that we're gonna do it at a coffee house you instead of a church. Answer. Let me say something about that. If you have conservatives working hard and doing innovative practices, and you have progressives complaining about those damned conservatives, <laughs> you can see who's going to get more results. <laughs> and what hasn't happened is to have progressives who have a more thoughtful understanding and more exactly you know, so that's what they, they just aren't getting out there doing it and they say we know a few are you know you've got you, yeah a few are but this is what we need we need people actually doing it and what and I so I don't think the conservative theology is the secret of this I think the simplicity the clarity the accessibility the hard work the you know that is really out there you know I grew up fundamentalist so I I know that world from the inside and I you know, you can explain an awful lot in the state of the mainline versus the evangelical charismatic church by just seeing how many dollars churches put into youth ministry. Evangelicals put, and Pentecostals put big money into youth ministry. They care about it. They work hard at it. And they have been since uh, right after World War II. Um, that hasn't happened among mainline Protestants because in the Christendom model, the assumption it was it's all going to work out, leave them alone, and they'll come home wagging their tails behind them and bringing their checkbooks with them. But, uh, so I just think part of this is hard work. And, and, not, and it's not hard work like miserable, it's kind of exciting and enjoyable. Uh, and uh, it, this is making me feel really good right now because my next writing project is really addressed at this very thing. Uh, how can we invite people into spiritual discussion and conversation without it being in that very rigid uh, framework? Well, it's helpful. I thought, I thought the conversation was going to go to sort of a dissolving between our traditional categories of service and evangelism. When we think about these semi-monastic communities or neo-monastic communities doing good in the sense of contributing and giving people a sense of purpose and meaning, they'll know we are Christians by our, by our love. Um, but there's room, it sounds like there's room oh, yeah. for much oh, yeah. more traditional evangelism as well and the hard work of training people to know their faith so they can share their faith and reach out. Simple without being simplistic, I think. This is, you, yeah. It, it, this, it, it, let me give you an example. What you said. So I left the pastorate seven years ago, so all my stories are getting old, but. <laughs> about nine or 10 years ago, a guy named Henry started coming to my church. And it's funny, because I'm at a Lutheran seminary and he was loosely connected to the Lutheran church and then he cussed out the minister and uh, decided to come to my church. <laughs> and he was a, a sort of a hard living, mean spirited guy. And I don't know 
he stuck around and started to slowly kind of let down his defenses. And his mother died and I did her funeral and I, I think he started to trust me. So one day he makes an appointment to see me. And I, this sounds like a joke, but this is, he was totally sincere. He said, Brian, look, I've been coming to church for a while. I've got one really, really big question. I don't want any, a little of this, a little of that. I want a clear answer. And I'm thinking, okay. He says, I want to know when I pray, is God up there or is God in here? Now that's his question. And? And. <laughs> well, I mean, but just you sort of want to sit with thinking, I, like, I can't even imagine asking that question. But he was dead serious. He needed a simple, clear answer. So I said, Henry, why don't you pray to God up there? Okay, thanks, that's what I needed. And he was a little surprised, like, where's the punchline? And I said, one thing though, if a Chinese person is down there praying to God up there, and you're here praying to God up there, where does that mean God is? Oh man, you did it to me again, he says. <laughs> But the reason that story comes to mind is he needed, it took him a long time to trust me with a question that was vexing him so much, you know. And like, I don't understand why that question would come to anybody's mind, but that was the question he had. And I just think we would be shocked at the questions that are really in people's minds and how different they are than the stuff we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, can, can I just say, I, I, when I was working on this new book that's uh, sort of uh, trying to introduce the Christian faith, um, I got together with a couple ministers in my area and we took a long walk. And I said, if somebody came to you and said, look, I'm not a Christian, tell me what this thing's about, what would you say? And these two, the two guys who I had this conversation in the most depth with, they both answered me the same way. They said, I have no idea what I would say. It would depend on what the person's questions were. And I thought to myself, this is wise pastoral leadership. Because you think of Jesus, you know, every person he interacts with, it's a little bit different. And this is one of our challenges, I think. We are so trained to have the program that we go out to everybody with, where so much depends on actually listening to people and really eliciting from them where they are, what their questions are, what their objections are. Oh my goodness, I just don't think we're going to get anywhere until we really elicit that from people. We have just a couple minutes. I want to ask one question about, uh, about the Bible. Often we characterize the challenge of the question as literal or not literal. So most of our congregations, that's not a major, major issue. There are always a few mm -hmm. people that surprise you. <laughs> um, the, other, the bigger question is, I don't get the connection between what you're reading about there and the rest of my life and all the stories that I see from government political current event stories to entertainment stories to family dramas um, what's your best advice or, or maybe the other way to put it when you hear someone open up scripture whether it's teaching or preaching and you think that's what it's about what's going on there what what how do we help our people see themselves in the story that for many of them is a you know, very different story than the one they're living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, one, of the, one of the things many of my emergence friends will say, talk, I'm Episcopalian, and they will refer to our teaching or our homilies as eight and a half minute drive-by shootings. And <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, yeah, again, you can't make that up. Uh, and I think that's a fair, uh, you know, the need to condense the story to some takeaway drives me crazy. And in an eight and a half minutes, that may be all you can do. Um, but one of the things that I find most um, fulfilling, gratifying, nourishing for me um, as I worship with emergence or even in Acts 29 churches, as far as that's concerned, is that there really is a teaching. There really is 20, 30, sometimes 45 minutes 
of actually opening up the scripture uh, in an almost midrashic way, as opposed to the Protestant way of having to make a point. Um, it's the making of a point of the takeaway that drives me crazy when I'm sitting in the pew or, or on the floor, wherever it is I am. That may not answer your question, but I don't think you can, I don't think you can do what's needed if you're trying to, to get takeaway, if you're trying, it, 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 it's not there. It, 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 it's, it's got to be opened up and lived and explored in terms of many possible applications, many possible implications, as opposed to a focused one. Um, and it, it, makes me, it makes me crazy uh, when I sit there and listen to a good man or woman <coughs> want to give me the takeaway. Uh, and don't do that to me. It's the word of God. I don't need you between, you know, me and it. Uh, explicate it, open it for me, but don't digest it. That's me. I don't know. <laughs> uh, two, two people come to my mind when you ask that, uh, David. One of them, I, do, are, do we have any people here who are part of the network of biblical storytellers? Ah, they are wonderful, aren't so, they? Yeah, there you go. Just keep your hands up for a second so people can come ask you about that later, okay? <laughs> so, the, the guy who leads, who started this is a fellow named Tom Boomershine. And Tom starts with a really obvious thing that I think we all know. And that is that the Bible's original form was not as a book. That, that almost all of the Bible started as oral performance art, really. Memorized oral tradition. So it starts as an oral tradition. And just... When you really let that sink in, uh, uh, Tom has in some ways been meditating on this for 30 or 40 years. You let that sink in, it's really, really takes you interesting places because we think of it as a book first, but really it's oral composition first. And then when you realize that these oral stories exist and eventually they're brought into a book, but the stories are often arguing with each other. And one of the things that I think has made the Bible be more alive for me, and when I talk about it to people, it's helping them realize that much of the dynamism of the Bible is in the tension between the two stories. So I was just telling Phyllis, I, I was reading the last few chapters of the book of Judges recently, and I don't know if any of you have read that but, lately, but it's like I keep wondering why they kept that in there. I mean... <laughs> There's a story about a rape, a dismemberment. It's, yeah, it's Game of Thrones. I mean, it's really horrific. <laughs> and, and then the ending is even worse when they, the perpetrators of the rape are then rewarded. And oh my gosh, it's everything that you see in corruption today. It's staggering patriarchy and chauvinism and discounting of women, you know. And you just read that and it makes you disgusted. And, and then the, you turn the page by chance, and the next page is the book of Ruth. And then you read the book of Ruth, and here it's a story where all the men die. <laughs> and, and the beauty is in a group of women, and in a woman, a Jewish woman and a Moabite woman who are supposed to be enemies, who have the good sense to stay together, and it's this fascinating, you, and then you take those two stories in contrast to each other. Well, what Tom really has helped me see is that so many of the most interesting things about the Bible are not in a story, but they're in the tension between two stories. The way he got me thinking about this is I said to him, I said, when you teach people to tell biblical stories, what do you do with the violent stories? like David killing Goliath. You know, we teach that to children and then tell them, don't throw stones, <laughs> you know? And then here was Tom's statement. I'm starting to think we should never tell the story of David killing Goliath without also telling the story of David not being able to build the temple because he was a man of bloodshed. Ooh, that's interesting. The other person who got me thinking about this is Walter Brueggemann. And Walter, for decades, has been uniquely sensitive to arguments and tensions in the text. And all I can say is, I think as we move forward, this is our way to transcend the old liberal conservative polarity. Because in a strange way, liberals and conservatives agreed 
that agreement was valid and disagreement was invalid. The only difference was conservatives said it all agrees and therefore it's valid. And the sort of classic liberals said, oh, there are contradictions and th that sort of devalued it. I, the way ahead on this thing, I think, is say, no, the disagreements are where the gems are. Revelation comes out in the tensions of, between the parts of the story. I just have a feeling that 20 years from now, that's going to be such a deep part of biblical preaching that it will really help us. Thank you both. I don't know where we'll be in 20 years, but I'm glad we'll be in a good